Welcome to The Fellowship. My name is Adam Hawk, and I am joined, as always, by Ryan Engel, and together we make up the two-man outfit, The Nation Golf Company, and this is our weekly iPod broadcast. If you haven't done so already, please make sure you are subscribed. It's free. It takes one click. It helps us out immensely, and you'll never have to go looking for this show again. It will find you and your phone automatically each and every Monday. And if you're feeling extra generous, consider leaving a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to us on, and then do the ultimate favor, the Lord's work, if you will, and tell a friend. Wouldn't that be great if people told their friends? I thought you were going to say, shoot a Venmo over. Oh, that would be nice too. Well, this is 2024, and these are the conversations we're all having with each other nowadays, isn't it? You ever double date with another couple or hang with someone that you haven't seen in a while or get caught in small talk without prepared material. What's the main topic that comes up in all of those situations? What are you watching these days? What podcasts are you listening to? Did you see this stupid reel on Instagram? We used to be a real society that had real conversations, but now we just want to know, how do you waste your time? You know what question never gets asked? What? What books are you reading right now? Yeah, well, books. Let me put you on the spot. What's the last book you read? And by read, I do mean finished. Couldn't tell you. Couldn't tell you. I think the last book I read cover to cover was The Catcher in the Rye. I have started some books over the years. It's not how you start. It's how you finish yeah. books. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read. I mean, I can, but I can't. Right. My ADHD is so gnarly. Like I'll start reading paragraphs, flicking pages, and my eyes are reading and my mind is going through the words, but I'm thinking about something else. Yep. I don't even remember what the fuck I just read. Can't do it. Can't do it. Can't win with them. Cannot win with them. Can't coach with them. Cannot coach with them. Can't do it. Can't do it. I've listened to a number of books on tape, but most of them have been biographies. Bob Odenkirk, that was a good one. Johnny Carson, another good one. I'm a bit obsessed with the audio medium, so I like a good book on tape, although there are always biographies, which when listening to a biography on tape, it's a lot like a deep dive podcast, so it barely counts as anything academic. Where was I? No idea. Ah, yes. Telling a friend about this podcast the next time someone asks you what podcasts you're listening to. Because these are the conversations we have today, folks. What are you watching? What are you listening to? Make sure to tell people you're listening to The Fellowship. Spread the word for us. A lot to talk about today. Let's get right into it. We have a new PGA Tour winner. The Women's U.S. Open restored my faith in professional golf. Scotty Scheffler took the high road so high that he might have overshot his landing. Shall we commence? The RBC Canadian Open is over. Your winner is Robert McIntyre, a 27-year-old Scottish lad who played on Europe's winning Ryder Cup team last year in Rome. Before we continue, Ryan, can you spell Robert's last name, McIntyre? Starts with an M. I get that. Is there anything between the M and the C? You mean the one thing that could possibly be between the M and the C? Yeah, is that happening? It's happening. <laughs> I'm not even going to try, dude. McIntyre. Just try. No. Okay, M-A-C-I-N-T-Y-R-E. That would have been hard. I was only asking you to spell it because I had to write it so many times in my show prep, and I wanted to share the annoyance. So here's the story from the Canadian Open. Robert McIntyre. Just a specimen of a 27-year-old, by the way. Peak male performance. Robert McIntyre, also known as Big Bob, just won his first PGA Tour event. and He's 27? Yeah. He's not looking 27. Well, he just won his first PGA Tour event, and he did it with his old man on the bag. Now, for my money, it doesn't get any better than that. If you're looking for one of the best stories in golf, look no further than this kid getting his first win and having his dad on the bag for it. And it only gets better when you hear the backstory that Big Bob moved to Orlando earlier this year to make his tour life easier, and he has been wickedly homesick ever since and hasn't found a caddy that he's wanted to stick with yet. So he called Pops, who cuts grass at a Scotland Lynx golf course, and bought him a plane ticket to Canada to loop for him this week. And he didn't do it because he thought his dad would be a great bag man. He did it because he just wanted to see his dad. And considering that his dad taught him the game and that these are Scottish lads who hail from the same land where golf was invented, this has to be one of the most special wins ever. So that was cool. Cool. Really cool. Cool. 
And the Canadian Open really needed something cool this week because it was a who's who of who the hell are these guys? Weakest field I've seen in a long time. No Scotty, no Xander, no Jordan, no JT, no Vic, no Max, no Ludwig Aubert, no punchable Wyndham Clark and his goofy putting routine. The list goes on and on. Is it just me or has that tournament just lost its luster over the years? And that's no offense to the Canadians. We love our northern hat, but... It just doesn't seem special. Am I right? Are you picking up on that? This was a B-side tournament and a damn shame considering it's Canada's National Open and there's a rich storied history of the Canadian Open with Arnie and Jack and Trevino and Tiger, but no one showed up this year and the leaderboard was like a bunch of recovering booze hounds in the basement of a church. Anonymous. And that sucks because we love America's hat. This show is proudly a friend of the Canadians and we are perpetually oot for a rip with the moose humpers. You still down for a rip? Are you bad? I'm from the great white north, right? Like up above the states. Yeah. The big landmass that the rest of the world hates. Yeah. We're like above that. Fucking north, I guess. The big patch of trees where everybody's bored to death. We're just chilling up here, sipping syrup, playing hockey. Before we learn to walk, we can cross check properly. Just yeah. rocking plaid jackets, chainsaws, we operate them right. Fucking A right, we do, bud. We cut our weight in firewood. Every 20 minutes or so, smoke break. And if the Leafs make the playoffs, I'll fucking jump in. The lake. Fucking buddy comes over to my place the other night and he's like, You wanna go out for a rip? And I was like, Fucking right. Yeah. So we hop in the truck and hit the mud and I was like, Oh, fuck yeah, bud. Just go for a rip, are you, bud? Just go for a rip. So at least Big Bob and his old man provided some feel good from the Great White North because nothing else did. That said, I'm happy for Big Bob and his dad, but I am not. Happy with Big Bob himself. Before we even go down that rabbit hole, I don't care what size you are. I'm not okay with the nickname Big Bob as a 27-year-old. You're just too young to get that name. You got to earn that. And that takes time. You can't be under 30 and have a Big Bob nickname. You're young, Bob. That is a little unhealthy. (laughs) But you're not Big Bob yet. You know what I mean? Like, okay. Big comes with age, I feel like, okay. for a nickname. Now, you can describe him as big, but if he's toting around the men's locker room as Big Bob, like, hang on, kid. You're not even a man yet. If I was in his circle of friends, that wouldn't be his nickname for me. Okay, so he's trending Bob, not Big Bob. Yeah, he's getting there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Growing Bob, you know? Okay. Bob on the rise. Sure, sure. <laughs> I like it. Building Bob. (laughs) Bulking Bob. I mentioned I'm not happy with Big Bob himself, or Mm. as I should say, Building Bob himself, because this dude was a bit of a clown show during the final round, barking at the CBS drone camera operators because the drone was too loud for his liking. More than once, he yelled at the camera people, and on the final time that he did, he said, and I heard this clearly on TV and so did everyone else, quote, I told you once, and I'm not going to tell you again. I'm going to give you one last chance before I go mental. I know I'm not American or Canadian, but, end quote. And it ends there because he either stopped talking or the television cameras turned the mic off. The dump button. A couple of things here. First off, shut the H up, Bob. And I mean, really, shut the H up. You're Bobby Mack. No disrespect, but until yesterday and at the moment that you were on the ninth hole when you accosted the camera people, you were a no one. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System, covering the PGA Tour on national network television, can have a drone camera, and they can especially have a drone camera covering the leader in their tournament that they are broadcasting. I got news for you, Bob. Where do you think your giant cardboard check for $1.7 million comes from? I will clue you in. It comes from the sponsors who pay to advertise on television, Bob. Now, I've never been to Scotland, and believe me, it's number one on my travel list, but here in North America, that includes Canada, we can't get anything on TV unless we film it with a camera. And some of those cameras for the last 10 years or so have been attached to drones. And I get it, drones are like leaf blowers, they're louder than they should be, but there were 143 other guys in that field, some a lot more famous than you, who weren't threatening to go, quote, mental on the camera people because drones are loud. It's part of the deal. What does that mean, go mental? I would have liked to see growing Bob go mental. 
what is he going to do? Take his shirt off and shimmy shake? Try to scare you? That's more of a Harry Higgs thing. I think with a bat in your hand and a drone above your head, you're going to start swinging at the drone. God, that would have been great. It really would have been. I wish it would have happened. If I was that drone operator, I would, I would have just been really telling the line of pushing that kid's buttons. Buzzing the tower. But it's part of the deal. You think Arnie and Jack and Tiger and Rory have ever had to deal with some noise before? Again, they are them and you are you. You don't get to threaten people with going, quote, mental on them because you don't like something, especially if that something is normal and accepted and part of the broadcast. And if that broadcast is the biggest reason you're getting paid. So take it easy, Bob. The other part I hated about his temper tantrum was that he implied that because he's Scottish and not American or Canadian, that CBS wasn't listening to his complaints about the drone. Come off it, mate. It has nothing to do with you being Scottish. The reason the drone is above your head is because you're leading the tournament on a Sunday. This is the same guy that was barking at the fans for moving too slowly to get out of his way and who actually got mad at a marshal for saying quiet, please, too loudly during his pre-shot routine. (laughs) If you think I'm alone on this, just know that the internet has already taken to calling him Big Baby instead of Big Bob. And if that sticks, he's going to have to wear that the rest of his life. Remember, Big Baby Glenn Davis from the NBA, that guy is on record saying how much he hates that nickname because of course he hates it. One, it's a shite nickname. And two, He's a big baby, and that's what a big baby would do, be a big baby about the nickname Big Baby. I'm glad I got that off my chest before all that because it just really proves my point loud and clear. You got to earn that nickname, and boy, he's got an uphill battle now. Big Bob? Didn't think so. You can't be big anything when you're 27. He can be a big baby. He can be a big baby. I'll give him that. And he was. All right, it's off to Muirfield for the Memorial, which is an elevated event, then to Pinehurst for the U.S. Open, a couple of good pro gaff weeks coming up. Over to the women's side, there was a United States Open Championship played at Lancaster Country Club in the great state of Pennsylvania. Second spelling bee question of the day. Ryan, can you spell Pennsylvania? (sighs) Probably not. You want to try? No. No. Boy, this was a lot more fun last night when I was thinking up these bits, and I thought, well, he's going to try to spell on the podcast. You want me to spell out loud in my head? Like, that's just not the way... I I I need a pen and paper. Out loud in your head are two opposing thoughts. Everyone knows what I meant. Can you just please try to spell out loud? Pennsylvania? Uh, P-E-N-N? Yep. S-Y-L-V... A-N-I-A-N. Oh, you had it. Why'd you add the N on the end? It's not Pennsylvanian. Oh, oh, it's I don't Pennsylvania. Know. That's why I, 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 I don't know. I, my ADD kicks in, and then I don't know where I'm at. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That was... I had it. You had if it. If I had it on paper, I would have written it down. Well, I'm glad you thought of how great that bit was going to be. It turned out even better than I thought. You uh, spelled it right, and then added an N for no reason. Well, there you go. I did win the spelling bee in second grade once, and it was a total fluke. But I got it, and just somehow they gave me the ones I knew. And I got a free ticket to Knott's Berry Farm. And then I lived that entire next year with this false identity, thinking that I was smarter than I was. And so when we get to the next year, I'm like, I'm winning this fucking spelling bee again. I'm getting free Knott's Berry Farm tickets. Watch this. Getting to round two. Teacher gives me cherry. I blew it. And then as I was spelling it incorrectly. The word cherry? Yeah, I think I put an A in there instead of an E. I just, I was too confident. I thought I had an easy one, and I was like, just went right to it, you know, and just like fucking spelt it wrong. The chick who I beat the year prior, she was way smarter than me, and right as I said the wrong letter, I heard her go, yes, like that, and it fucking pissed me off. Long story short, I got sent to the principal's office, lost the spelling bee, got a little time out, realized from that point on I wasn't as smart as I thought. But how many spelling bee titles do you have, Adam? Never competed in a spelling bee. Don't know how good at it I would be. Congratulations on your win in second grade. Sorry you couldn't go back to back. But (laughs) potentially a good thing because winning tickets to Knott's Ghetto Farm is like winning a ticket to playing Russian roulette. You might survive. Yeah. But then again, you might not. Montezuma's Revenge. Oh, sure. When was the last time they lubed those berries? (laughs) The sound that thing makes... Are washers going to fly off and hit someone in the face? 
Now, I don't have a breakdown of the U.S. Women's Open other than to say that I was far more aware of this ladies major than I've ever been aware of a ladies major before. And a lot of that has to do with Nellie Corda and her six wins and seven starts and the fact that she has me and a whole lot of other people at least keeping a side eye on women's golf. And this is how it starts, right? Some supernova goes brightly blasting through a dark part of the sky, and you can't help but look over. And in the process, that supernova lights up some other stars in the galaxy you otherwise wouldn't have seen. And if it burns bright enough, long enough, you might see some other things that hold your attention. That's what Nellie Corda is doing for women's golf right now. And thanks to her, here's what I saw this weekend at the U.S. Women's Open. I saw, and you're not going to believe this, Ryan, I saw golf the way you and I have been dreaming it could and should be played. I'm telling you right now, everything we've been talking about, everything that we want in the game of golf is over on the women's side. At least it was this weekend at Lancaster. Because I watched the final round yesterday, and golf, when you take 300-yard drives away, is a completely different and completely better game to watch. We have this like false perception that birdies are more exciting than bogeys. And that's just not the case. Watching the world's best struggle and get that bogey and seeing them a little upset, a little hot, going to the next tee, feeling the pressure to get it back, that's the excitement. When you're just flinging it at the hole and ripping birdies, you're kidding yourself if you think that's more exciting than watching these guys get tested. You're not paying close enough attention. Either that or you just don't really know this game as well as you think you do. I want to be careful because I don't want to come off as patronizing or giving backhanded compliments because what I'm essentially saying is that when you have golfers who can't hit it as far, you have a better product. And I don't mean that as a slight because I understand it can sound like a slight that a worse golfer somehow makes for a better game. But I'm not calling women worse golfers because they aren't as powerful. Quite the opposite, actually. Women are far more compelling golfers because over on the women's side, they are hitting every club in the bag. They are taking long irons into greens and deploying a lot more strategy and course management because quite frankly, they have to. And that's golf. That's really what the game is. It's a test of the 14 clubs in the bag and the six inches between your ears. It's not bomb and gouge. That kind of golf is boring. And we've seen this in baseball. All the power and all the analytics and all the specialization turned baseball into a three-outcome sport. When you have every pitcher on the roster throwing 100 and every hitter groomed for launch angle, swinging out of his ass, batting 220, trying to lift one over the fence, you get one of three things, a walk, a strikeout, or a home run. And there are no three outcomes that actually produce less action than a walk, a strikeout, or a home run. Well said. Those outcomes are static and completely devoid of action. You're either walking to the dugout, walking to first base, or jogging around the sacks in a dead ball scenario. This got so bad so quickly in baseball that the league actually adopted some pretty radical rules to make it go away. Pitch clocks, limited mound visits, minimum batters faced, no shifts, and bigger bases to encourage stealing. Why? Because baseball is a better, more complete game when there are runners on the diamond, situational hitting, stolen bases, well-timed drag bunts, and pitchers who have to stay in the game to work out of jams. The game got faster and better and more complete, and this wasn't an evolution. This was a return to the way it used to be. And golf on the men's side is in drastic need of similar changes. Baseball saw the writing on the wall proposed some rule changes that were universally hated when they first came out, but they knew it was for the greater good and the long-term sustainability of the game. So they took the PR hit, the bad press, the pissed off fans on social media, and they stuck to it. And no one talks about it anymore. Hell, the same people that were mad hardly even remember there were rule changes a few years ago because they worked, because it was the right thing to do, and because they quite literally saved the game by making these changes. Golf needs to do the same thing, and the women's game proves that. I cannot tell you how much more enjoyable it was to watch seeing players have to hit four irons from the fairways on par fours. Not because I'm a glutton for punishment, but because a four iron from 190 yards has a much different ball flight than a seven iron. It's low, it's drawing, it's on the ground faster and rolling, it requires perfect contact and distant control, it yields a further proximity to the hole, putting a major premium on good putting and an even bigger premium on birdies like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. It makes every result more special and it makes every shot more consequential. 
And when everything is more consequential, the nerves are heightened. We have even talked about this, the mental aspect. When the nerves are heightened, you either see greatness or a train wreck. And that is golf. 17 Indian Wells. Dog leg left. There's what used to be tamarisk trees on both sides. Now it's just on the right side. But there's a bunker in the landing zone if you try to cut the corner. And there's a big eucalyptus tree on the corner. So back in the day, you had to steer one right to left. That was the only option you had. Or you hit one straight out to the corner and you had a long way coming in to a tiny front to back green. That hole was extremely challenging. Now with bread boxes hanging off of a graphite noodle, even amateurs can tee up left and launch one high over the corner and fade one into the middle of the fairway with nine iron distance in. Modern technology has killed that hole. And if you were a true golfer and you were watching the 1987 Bob Hope and you're watching Mark O'Mara lead the tournament, come down the stretch, have all the pressure in the world on him to get through 17 and try to birdie 18 to get to a playoff, and he hits a butter knife blade two iron through a tire right to left that paints the fairway, avoids the bunker, and trickles into eight iron distance. Just a masterful golf shot with a hard club to hit, shaping it to perfection. Goes up there, gets into the playoff, and in that playoff, they have to play 17 and 18 four times. And he steps up all four times and hits that same shot. Meanwhile, Corey Pave and all these guys, they're playing hockey. They're all over the fucking place. He got so robbed in that tournament because being a true golf fan and knowing what kind of shots to truly appreciate, the fact that he went up there and hit that shot four times in a row perfectly with a two iron, the tournament on the line, and he just wasn't able to convert birdie, Corey Pavin ends up winning that event because he pull hooks one into the left rough with his driver and then chunk runs one up to the front edge of the green and just gets lucky and chips one in for birdie. Meanwhile, O'Mara was on the green just burning edges. Pavin ends up winning that event. The point here is that we've just lost that type of golf. When amateurs can take apart these golf courses now, just because the technology, it's blasphemy, Hawk. That's top golf. That's not the game. And having to sit back there and shape one like that, that's so much cooler. And for those that don't think so, you're just telling me you're new to golf and you don't know any better. There's nothing nervy about hitting a tricked out driver 320 yards because you can swing out of your ass and know that a super tech club face is going to forgive every mishit. And there's nothing really nervy about hitting an 80 yard wedge shot into damn near every green all tournament long. So you have a game that's become too easy for the men. And when it's too easy, you don't get the mental component as ratcheted up as it should be. And this yields a very boring product. Remember when I talked about the three outcomes in baseball, a walk, a strikeout or a dinger. That's golf on the men's side, a three-club game, driver, wedge, putter. Four under won yesterday's U.S. Women's Open. 21 under won last month's PGA Championship. The women are playing golf. The men are playing a video game. And the big difference here is distance off the tee. That's it. That's the entire rub. One group hits it a mile every time and renders a golf hole completely obsolete regardless of where their ball lands. And one group is playing every club and every shot and can play their game on any course in the world because strength and technology isn't turning these historic venues into jokes. This is why it's so baffling to me that the majority of golf fans are opposed to the ball rollback. You clearly have a generation of golfers and a generation of technology that have quite literally outgrown the golf courses they play on. Nothing about today's men's game is sustainable or entertaining. It's a long drive competition on a piece of land that isn't big enough to host it anymore. The only thing wrong about the golf ball rollback is that it's not happening soon enough, that it doesn't take it far enough, and that it doesn't also happen to include severely limiting the golf clubs too. But beyond how much better and more complete the women's golf was that I watched yesterday is how these ladies carry themselves out there. Yuka Sasso of Japan was winning the tournament by two strokes with three to play when she got to the 16th green with an eagle putt. Her competitor, Hanako Shibuno, was three shots back and was seen on TV rooting Sasso's putt to drop. 
And on 18, when Sasso stuffed her approach to ice the championship, Shibuno was back in the fairway clapping and jumping up and down. Beyond that, after making bogey on 17 and letting Angela Lee hang around in contention, Yuko Sasso signed autographs for kids between walking from 17 green to 18 T. Are you kidding me? you love to see it. On the men's side, big baby Bobby Mack is yelling at a drone operator <laughs> and the fans and the marshals in a B-side tournament that he's winning by three strokes. The men's golf side is very Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Roy Ragey. Poopy diaper interviews from Barry Bonds. It's got that same vibe to it. These guys are all jacked and serious, and it's that. For sure. You can see it. So Bobby Max going mental on drones and Yuko Sasso is signing autographs in the middle of the U.S. Open after making a bogey on her way to the 72nd hole of a major championship. Everything about what I saw yesterday was so much better on the women's side. Real golf, real players, real genuine interactions with each other and the galleries. It was really everything that we've been talking about the last year on this podcast about what we want to see on the men's side. The sad reality is that we will never see that on the men's side, and women's golf likely won't ever be as popular as it should be, given how damn good the product is. Agreed. All right, that's a lot of golf talk so far, so let's deviate for a moment, shall we? Let's do it. I know summer doesn't start until June 21st, but I don't follow some seasonal calendar written a billion years ago. Summer starts when the kids come home from school. That's my calendar, and I'm not a fan of summer which I should be because there's a lot to celebrate every summer. Father's Day later this month, my wedding anniversary on the 26th. The 4th of July is an all-time great holiday. My daughter and I share the same birthday on July 7th. My wife's birthday is on July 15th. But every rose has its thorns, and summer has a lot of them. So if you'll indulge me, I wrote a poem about it. Ooh, It's called Ode to Summer, or in the spirit of Craig Dunlap, Chode to Summer. Wow. You ready? Do I have a choice? No. Summer is here, everyone's favorite season, but I often ask myself, for what reason? Sure, the sun is out, but so is school. Now my kids are home every day, and that's not very cool. (laughs) That doesn't mean I don't love them or think that they're neat. Really? But it's two little ones running around in a house that's just a thousand square feet. All they say is, I'm hungry, and dad, we're so bored. 90 more days of this? Good Lord. If I was the president... Temperatures over 75 wouldn't be legal. Now I'm sleeping naked with a fan blowing on my junk. Spread eagle. (laughs) I'd be a lot less hateful of summer and probably wouldn't care if instead of wall unit AC, we had central air. (laughs) But we don't. And Fullerton in July is like living on the sun. And I swear I'll bitch slap the next person who says going to the beach is fun. Oh, yeah? (laughs) The loading up, the parking, the getting burned. What about all the sand brought back inside? lesson learned. This truly is my least favorite time of year. Roaches coming in the house, my absolute worst fear. Why do cockroaches show up when it's hot? And why don't they die when I spray the pesticides we bought? Summer can go to hell for all I care and say hello to the roaches when it finally gets there. If this is your favorite season, you can keep it. I can't wait for fall and winter. Best believe it. Wow. Chode to Summer by Adam Hawk. You are the grumpiest guy. <laughs> you are. You're the grumpiest guy ever. Ever. What's funny is you're just like, you're relishing and so proud about that little number you did. All it was was just speaking to everyone how grumpy you are. So congratulations. Great poem. Grumpiest guy. Grumpiest guy I've ever seen. He's the grumpiest. Oh, the countdown to fall is on. Wow. Wow. Back to golf for a minute. We didn't talk about it last week, but the four charges brought against the world's number one golfer, Scotty Scheffler, including second degree felony assault of a police officer, were dropped. Felony assault. What a joke. And with a bunch of new video released from the arrest, not only should those charges have been dropped, but they never should have been brought against him in the first place. Did you hear the taped conversation with the other officer once he was in custody? I did crazy dude what i didn't like about that conversation is the officer was clearly trying to bait him into yeah. incriminating himself and scotty scheffler being very rattled at five in the morning and in a foreign situation he nearly did he nearly did and that's a situation in which you just say i'm going to take my right to remain silent and wait till i get a lawyer but scotty was just blabbing out the mouth 
almost incriminating himself. And that officer was happy to lead him down that path after the other officer had ripped him from his car, thrown him against his door, arrested him, and brought some bogus charges against him. I am a supporter of police. I believe that we need them, and they're, for the most part, here to protect us and protect law. But everyone's human, and we're all sinners, and we all are imperfect, and there are bad ones too. And at the end of the day, you have to protect yourself first. Just a little tip for everyone, a little pro tip here. Close up that jaw, seal up those flapjacks. The best thing you can say when you're in a situation like that, I don't answer questions. They can keep asking and you just say, I don't answer questions. Because the last thing you want to do if you're getting pulled over or apprehended or God forbid, arrested by what you think is a bad cop in an unjust situation, worst thing you can do is flap those jacks. The video looks so bad for the arresting officer, but the charges have been dropped and Scotty Scheffler released a statement, which I hate. I hate his statement and I'm going to read it and I'm going to tell you why I hate it. It reads, quote, as I stated previously, this was an unfortunate misunderstanding. I hold no ill will toward Officer Gillis. I wish to put this incident behind me and move on, and I hope he will do the same. Police officers have a difficult job, and I hold them in high regard. This was a severe miscommunication in a chaotic situation. End quote. I hate this statement. I like Scotty, but I hate this statement. Hate? I hate it. It's way too nice, and it's actually so nice that it misses a chance to hold someone in power accountable for abusing their power. This officer in question leaped at Scotty's vehicle like a madman, pulled him out of the car, threw him against the door, cuffed him, charged him. He struck him. And put him in jail. If that can happen to Scotty Scheffler, a rich white guy on his way to work, it can happen and does happen to anyone all the time across the country. And I get that cops have a hard job and I support the police and I'm damn glad to have them in my neighborhood, but there are assholes in any job and cops aren't above that. They do not get carte blanche. There are bad teachers, bad church pastors, bad youth coaches, bad soldiers, bad doctors. There are bad people in every profession. You can support the police and also support holding the bad cops accountable. In fact, you should, it makes the world better for everyone. You know who stands to benefit the most by bad police officers being held accountable? Good police officers. You know how bad it sucks to be a good cop and have your reputation at an all-time low because of bad cops? Good point. They are the ones ruining it for the men and women of law enforcement who do a good job. So I hate the statement from Scotty because it essentially says, it's fine. It's fine to jump on someone's car, rough them up not listen to reason, lie about what happened in a police report and charge them felonies and put them in jail. Why? Because cops have a hard job. You know what, Scotty? It's actually not a hard job if you can do whatever you want, lie about it and have people like you, the victim, back them up. Then it becomes an easy job. Again, I agree that cops have a hard job, and I'm pro-police, but I'm not pro-bad police, and I'm not about making their job easier by letting them do whatever the hell they want and lie about it. Not everyone who gets wrongfully thrown in jail and charged with felonies has celebrity status or a bottomless bank account or the best lawyers. In fact, most of them don't. And you just told all those people that it's fine. It's a misunderstanding. Here's what I think and why I really hate the statement. I think it's a selfish statement. I think it's made by someone who doesn't live in the same reality as the general public, and it's made by someone who is surrounded by police and security at their day job. There are dozens and dozens of cops at every golf event, and some of them assigned just to work security for Scotty as he walks around the track. And yes, I do think Scotty made this statement because it's a lot easier to be around those people if you appear to be an empathizer and not a whistleblower. And that's how all this bullshit continues. This isn't about some woke liberal protester take. This is about accountability. The proof is in the video. Scotty was wrongfully arrested, wrongfully charged, wrongfully thrown in jail, and the officer lied out his ass on a police report about it. And then Scotty said, no worries, you have a hard job. And he said that to the world. That's bad. That doesn't help anyone except you, Scotty, and the bad cops. And that's why I hate the statement. You done? Yeah. You okay? I'm fine. I tell my daughter when she gets worked up to blow out the candles. (sighs) 
It helps. Let me ask you a question, Hawk. What would Jesus do? I don't know, but I resent the implication that Jesus would do what Scotty just did because I forgive. It's not about forgiving. It's about uh, letting someone off the hook that could potentially endanger other people. You don't people think in that guy's under a micro- microscope now? I don't know, but he would have been under a much bigger microscope if Scotty decided to take it out. But he did not take the microscope out. I get where you're coming from. I just think it's a little bit too emotional of a response. Here's the thing. Maybe Scotty doesn't want to be a martyr for this cause, and that's fine. He didn't ask to be put in this position, so he doesn't have to be the poster boy for calling out bad policing. Great. Then just don't say anything. Don't write the statement. He took the high road. He's moving on. He's got some golf tournaments to win, his family to take care of, a career to look after. And everyone knows that the guy was wrong and it was bullshit. That guy's going to have a hell of a hard time. So he just he just took the high road, and I'm cool with it. Okay, I am not cool with it because yeah. instead uh, of clearly, I can tell you're all worked up. I just would have rather not heard anything than hear that bullshit. That's a stretch to call it bullshit. I mean, maybe that's how he really feels. You don't fucking know. If that's how you really feel, you're dead ass wrong. A cop uh, roughing you up, lying, incorrectly arresting you, and charging you with felonies that were he was so- wrong to call it a misunderstanding. It was a misunderstanding. That's exactly what it was. He wasn't wrong. This is the problem with emotional responses. He's wrong to let somebody... Blow out the candles. You need to take it down eight notches. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, sorry to end on that note, but we got to go. I got stuff to do. You got stuff to do. Wow. No, we got to go. Folks, he's riled up. I'm not riled up. Are you going to do your patented Adam Hawk, just go outside and pace back and forth in the parking lot looking up at the clouds (laughs) with big old exhales? I love when you do that. All right. Thanks so much for listening. We will see you next Monday. Adam will be all right, everybody. 